And we're back. And do not adjust your monitors, guys. I am doing a team match. This is, again, from the round of eight at the Novi Sad uh, European Zonal Championship. Team on the left is Great Britain. Team on the right is Italy. Let's do this. Three, two, one, go. Okay, hold on just a sec. There we go. All right. So there's going to be a bit of downtime as we introduce the teams. Uh, team on the left is Great Britain. It is a noticeably younger lineup than the ones we may be used to seeing from Great Britain. Uh, I see James Andrew Davis there. I believe that's Marcus Mepstead, uh, Ben Peggs, and... Oh my god, is that Keith Cook? I actually didn't know he was in this. <laughs> um, I've been watching quite a lot of Keith Cook's bouts uh, in the last few years. Um, I saw him at a lot of Commonwealth Championships. Uh, he's quite a dynamo. He's got pretty good footwork and loves his uh, flicks. Team on the right, Italy. I imagine this is going to be their main lineup, so Cassara, Facconi, Garazzo. Um, their alternate may be a Vola. It's going to be Cassara up first, and Marcus Nepstead for uh, Great Britain. So this is going to be uh, a long haul. It's uh, like a 50-minute video, I think. So buckle your seatbelts. There's going to be a lot of fencing to talk about. I hope my throat can handle it. Um, it is a little bit late, so I may end up drinking some tea or some water. Um, but I will try and maintain a consistent uh, level of commentary all the way through. Whether that level is particularly high is still uh, up for debate. So, yep, Mepstead, Kassara. Um, I don't know that much about Mepstead internationally. He was kind of um, one of the, I hesitate to say B team, but not one of the main three in the international squad. It was Halstead, Davis, and uh, Richard Cruz for quite a while. But it's kind of uh, in a transition period now. Mepstead's seeing a lot more international uh, fencing. And the spout gets right underway. Kassara, obviously, tall Italian lefty. Mepstead's quite short by comparison. Kassara marching. And finishes. That is attack right. Kassara taking control of the bout. Mepstead, I have to believe, is a bit less experienced than him. Kassara's been around for an incredibly long time since before the fabled timing change of 2004. Ooh, and he's off the strip. Is that gonna put him over the edge? Oh my god, that is quite a way to start this bat out. Uh, no, it's not. He's right straddling the end line. Oh, that is danger zone. Kassara trying to maybe get a bit more space in the strip now. Mepstead's not willing to give it to him. Steps in with the pair of post. It's interesting. Mepstead opting to stonewall Kassara's attack there and maybe keep him pinned to the end if possible. And attack right off target, yep. Also interesting to note, um, normally the configuration here of the two fencers would be reversed because Kassar is a lefty. You normally want the front side of the target facing the referee. But because this is a team match, not an individual bout, uh, the fencers stay on the side that corresponds to their team. So this will be maybe a little bit more challenging for the referee. For us, it's cool because we get an angle that's not normally seen in televised fencing. Um, we'll get to see a lot of these... Uh, action to the flank and back that we wouldn't normally. And especially for lefty versus righty, that kind of far outside line is a pretty commonly used one. More marching here from Kassara. Staying in four a lot. Pretty withheld. Finishes long off target. Uh, sorry, not off target. On target. Kind of impressed that he found that. Distance looked pretty short for that type of finish. But of course, Kassara's point control is uh, certainly up there. The Italians have point control as uh, one of their many, uh, very many strong suits. Italy, obviously, a very strong nation in foil. But of course, you did not need me to tell you that. Although, as I say that, Kassara completely misses that finish. And that one was quite shorter and looked more appropriate for the distance. So nice counterattack there by Mepstead. And he marches. Sorry, disrupts it though, starts marching himself. Nice and easy. Finishes long, but again, no light. Interesting. Nepstead offers if he wants to test, but Kassar is fine. Let's see. This still feels a little bit like a figuring you out sort of um, bout. Kassar, I'm not sure if he's willing to press any of his actions too far. Tries a <laughs> little bit of a lazy counterattack there from Kassar. Honestly, Nepstead just pulls the trigger and finishes long, and it catches him. With his proverbial, ugh, with his proverbial pants down. Gets a stop hit, though. Closes out with his arm. Maybe he gets hit in the elbow there. You deserve it, closing out that way. But anyway. Um, finishes long. Again, goes off target. This is surprisingly close. I wouldn't have thought that Mepstead would be able to compete this evenly against Kassara, but he's holding his own. 
Of course, in team matches, I'm not going to go into how team matches work. I assume everyone watching this channel knows. Um, but with encounters this short, like five touch bouts basically, or maybe more if you're down, um, but with these shorter bouts, certainly capped at three minutes, there's not going to be that much time to experiment and find actions that work. So although fencing is an individual sport, there is an ele a definite element of uh, talking with your teammates and uh, explaining actions that worked well or actions that didn't work well in a given match or a given uh, encounter. And now Mepstead is up in score. Kasari keeps marching. Turn the camera, I can't see what's going on. Okay, finds Ramiz. Was there core core beforehand? Referee says yes. Or maybe he was off the strip because they did shift down a little bit. Finishes off target again, going for the flank. Mapstead knows to close that out, it looks like. So we might see, uh... Ooh, interesting. I'm not sure what the referee would call that. Maybe Ramiz. And we're all tied up at four. Okay, attack, no attack. Hmm. So yeah, not a bad show. Oh, with the closeout in four! Kassar tried to finish in preem, but it was the wrong choice of line. And with that, Britain is up 5-4. Mepstead showing what he's got against Kassara. Not a bad start. And here we have Keith Cook. I did not think he would be in this match. That is really awesome to see. Uh, I've been kind of waiting for him to break into the higher international level. Mepstead offering some advice against Faconi. Now, Alessio Faconi, this guy is dangerous. Um, yeah. Uh, for me, he kind of came out of nowhere shortly after Rio. I didn't really follow the Italian scene that much. And of course, Italy has a huge number of fencers all near the top of their sort of national ranking so it can kind of be a toss-up who their international squad is from year to year it's sort of stabilizing now though Kassara is still lingering <laughs> or uh enduring um and Faconi and Grazzo are now the two other main heavy headers with Evola up there as well Keith Cook coming right out now one thing I know about Cook is he's really good at moving fast and he really likes to flick uh we'll see if he can make that work um Honestly, it kind of reminds me of the Korean style a little bit. Maybe less flat-out aggression than uh, the Koreans do. But certainly actions like that, yeah, just bounce, bounce, step in. Fakoni isn't quite ready. Um, that said, though, I do believe Cook is a little bit newer to the, like, super high international level that uh, these Italians really comprise. So we'll see if he's able to make this continue to happen. Oh, this is the first one, though. Fakoni gets a remise. Alrighty. More marching from Faconi. Willing to give it up, though. And again, this is mostly... Oh, nice long finish there. I did not see that coming. And clearly neither did Cook. He didn't even try and run away until it was far too late. But yeah, this feels like probing. Although, um, one of Alessio's strengths... I may have talked about this in a previous bout of his. Gets the counterattack there, though. Um, one of Alessio's main strengths is he can transition from that, like probing kind of cautious forward movement to just finishing and you don't realize it it's very smooth smooth as butter um that's something that the russians are also quite good at disguising the acceleration so that things like stop hits tend to not work very well uh it's very hard to find the right timing if it's so smooth like that cook opting instead to just keep the distance a little bit wider i think yeah getting away from uh, Faconi's attempts at reposting so he's got to step in to attack, though, and Faconi might decide to opt to crush the distance there. Decide to opt to... Ah, oh, too many words. Again, more fast probing from Cook, but doesn't look like he's going to commit to anything too serious from that far away. Or is he? Keeping it wide on defense, of course, because he's probably worried about that acceleration. I think that speed attack right, no. Could be wrong about that. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Again, not quite sure how Fakoti didn't get a light. There was blade contact there. It may have been Cook's parry. Long finish, though, and that's parry post right. Yeah, actions like that are probably not going to work so well against the Italians. They just have the training and the experience and the sheer hand speed to be able to get that. 
What is the call there going to be? I kind of wasn't paying attention. I was talking. Critical mistake for a commentator, of course. What is the call going to be? Attack no, attack touch. Ooh. <laughs> no light at all. And Cook has stepped past, I think, before Ficoni starts the remise, so he's safe. Ficoni starts. That was a nice timing from Cook, but it was fake from Ficoni, so maybe just gave away information there. Ball marching. Cook again, keeping the distance fairly wide. Starts himself. Nice back and forth we have going on here. Who's going to break inside the distance? And more marching. Cook changing lines a lot. Gets a random off target. That constant line changing from Cook is nice. Uh, it makes it very hard for Ficoni to predict uh, where he's going to be, so counterattacking becomes more difficult. Um, on the other hand, maybe makes Cook a little bit less accurate with the finish. If he's constantly changing lines like that, his tip may not be in the right place. Ooh! Trade flicks to the back. Again, very cautious here. Coney doesn't really care, though. He's up in score. Misses the first repost, and that's probably going to be Cook's remise, I have to say. No, it's not. Maybe he picked up the blade a second time, and I didn't hear it. Anyway, Ficoni showing his uh, prowess against Keith Cook. I'm really glad that uh, Cook is competing here, but um, not so happy for that result. Um, but now we're going to see Ben Peggs. Uh, again, kind of like Mepstead, I'm not as familiar with him. I've seen a couple of bouts of his um, the last few years, but haven't seen anything too spectacular. And he will be up against Giorgio Avola, who, uh, as you probably know, is going to be the subject of my next Rio analysis versus Alex Marcialis, in which Alex has an amazing comeback. So uh, stay hyped for that, as always. But we'll see if uh, Pegs can replicate that feat. Uh, Though he's down 10-7, not 14-7 like Alex was. We'll see. Avola also just very, very strong competitor across the board. Very well-rounded, too. Great tactics. And I wish the camera would rotate to show what's going to happen on that side of the strip. Pegs. Ooh. Acceleration was a little bit overzealous, it looked like. He wasn't ready to finish so soon, and Avola just didn't step back, so he kind of overestimated the distance there. Finish straight from Avola. Attack right. Pegs thought he picked up the blade. I didn't see it that way. Not sure what the referee said there. Actually, it's getting a little bit dark out. I'm going to turn the light on. There we go. Okay. And Avola marches fast. Come on, turn the camera. Oh, I can't see it. Oh, this is terrible. Pegs being quite cautious. Again, accelerates fast. It's those first fast few, ugh, those fast first few steps that are going to kill Beg, uh, Ben here if he keeps doing that. It's it's less the fact that he's accelerating fast and more the fact that his speed is constant after that first acceleration, and that even two steps in a row like that, Giorgio can counterattack pretty easily, or at least get inside the distance safely. It's very easy to mess with your opponents if you know exactly what speed they're going. Oh, very close to the end of the strip, though, Pegs. And Avola just finishes straight again. That I will chalk up to his superior point control. But Pegs was also very close to going off the strip. More slow marching from Pegs. Is he going to do that same acceleration as before? Misses the first repost. Jojo gets away. <laughs> oh, get wrecked. I feel bad for you, Pegs, but that was very nice from Avola. You can see what Pegs did there towards the end, stepping in, searching for the blade. That can work. Um, oh, man. Avola. Giorgio Avola. 5-0, Ben Pegs. Continue on with your bad self, my good sir. Gonna go back to Keith Cook versus Kassara this time. Wow. Avola was on fire that bout. I am i can't even retroactively analyze a lot of that. That was just him being really, really good at fencing. Um, <laughs> Alright. So we're going to see probably the shortest fencer on the British side versus the tallest on the Italian side. So you can see the difference in height right now. Uh, it's pretty massive. Um, I 
say this a lot, but the shorter fencers tend to have um, more naturally explosive footwork. They've got a little bit better leverage in their limbs um, and a lower center of gravity. Uh, but fencers who are tall like Kasara are probably used to that by now. Attack stops, attack touch. Interesting. It looked like Kasara was almost ready to... Uh... Oh, Kasara very close to the edge of the strip. And again, because it's lefty righty, the fencers are on the close side of the strip facing the wrong direction, so to speak. The referee might have a harder time seeing their feet towards the edge of the strip because normally when the lefty righty fencers drift to the outside, they're going farther away from the referee. The referee can see their feet in its peripheral vision. It's going to be a little bit harder here. So Kasara might be able to get away with this cheeky kind of gliding off the strip and the referee might not notice it fast enough. Although, Cook steps in with the very fast counterattack and Kasara is not quite ready again. More marching from Kasara though. Cook tries to step in, closing out on the outside, but Kasara reaches around it for the touch. There's such a huge range that Kasara could finish at, that at which Kasara could finish, I should say, that Cook is going to be very hard pressed. He's definitely got the speed capability to deal with it, but the question is, can he put himself at the right place at the right time? Um, despite this massive, uh, not only reach advantage, but in terms of finishing explosively, um, Kasara could still catch him, even if he's doing everything right. There's very little room for mistakes here for Cook. And even like that, Kasar can just find the blade, hit off target before Cook can really finish stepping in. More bouncing on defense. Really keeping the distance wide. And very well, actually. That bounce, bounce, big retreat is a very nice footwork pattern for Cook, as long as he knows the acceleration and he can reliably see it coming. Oh, wow! Manages to step in. Actually, I'm impressed that Kasara found it off target there at all. That was a really well-timed step in, actually, from Cook. That's probably going to be attack right. Or is it? Because So Kasara did pause. My first instinct would be Kasara falls short, Cook's first falls short, and then Kasara just keeps going. Uh, if Kasara hit the first one, or sorry, if Cook hit the first one. Okay, yeah. So that's something, oh, I forget which bout it was. It was a Rio bout. I think it might have been Garazzo who did it against Abel Kassem. Or maybe against Ayad. Um... It's like a counter time, but instead of using parry or post, ah, I wish the camera would turn. Instead of using parry or post for a counter time, you instead just stop moving forward. Your opponent's counter attack falls short, and then you continue. So it's a second attention action, but with no blade contacts. It's really cool when it works, uh, and Kasara made it work there, and here he just finishes his attack. Cook can't really step in safely against it. Like I said, Kasara's got a huge window in front of him that, to work with when he's attacking, especially against Cook. It's going to be hard for him to get from one side to the other. And again, tries a stepping and counterattack, but Kassar just has time to finish to the right line. And that is all she wrote for that bout. Italian's taking a pretty convincing lead now, 20 to 8. Of course, Mepstead had a very nice bout against Kassar earlier. So if he can keep that performance going, he might be able to do very well. But Giorgio Avola, of course, uh, was having an amazing bout against uh, his opponent. Uh, ben Pegs, so unclear. I, I gotta give this one to Avola, but we'll see if Mepsa can get some touches back. Unlikely that he'll get all the way to 25, but you never know. <clears throat> ah, my throat's starting to go. I hope I can survive the entire match. Life of a commentator is uh, not as easy as it might seem. We have to contend with things like throat, uh, throat scratchiness. Has my audio just cut out? I cannot hear anything. Oh, there it. Okay. Phew. That was a close one. All right. In the meantime, Avola facing off against Mepstead. Tries a long advance lunge. Mepstead gets away from it. Again, that parry repose to the back. Parry four flick to the back from Avola. Finds enough target this time. Could just as easily have been a light for him, though. Flesh from Avola. Very rare that you see a proper flesh in foil. It's a lot of running attacks. But that was a legit flesh. <laughs> So that's as, that's as epic as we'll get on this channel, I guess. Slow march from Mepstead. Avola marching once again. Mepstead keeps the distance very consistent, which is nice. Foot nearly off the strip, but he's safe. More marching from Mepstead. Avola faints into the distance and gets away. 
Steps in with the parry post. Does not find it though, and Mepstead gets a light with his Ramiz. A little bit lucky there. But I'm sure he'll take it. More marching. Volo puts out the line. Again, just kind of playing around with Mepstead's attack, seeing what he can do with it. Doesn't feel very urgent yet. Avola's parry post is just so good that I think he's not really going to be afraid unless it gets to that situation again. And again, he misses the post. That's a pretty noticeable weakness. It's happened twice now. So Mepstead might be a little bit more opportunistic with his next few and go for the remise there. Again, parry post ineffectual. Avola tries to chase him away. Mepstead's doing a great job staying alive, though, I have to say. Any one of those long finishes from Avola, if Mepstead just takes one step too few or retreats one tempo too late, he's going to get hit. Right there, though, again, parry post came from Avola is just super good. Despite missing a few earlier. Super slow. Probing with the blades. Probably waiting for that acceleration from Avola again. Mepsa just taking the blade a lot. And there's the acceleration. Ooh, wow! These Italians, they accelerate and then they just stop. And their opponent kind of flails there for a bit. That is interesting. Uh, probably a sharper opponent than Nepstead might have gone straight into that, but Avola probably would have been ready for the parry or post, honestly. So perhaps it was fortuitous that Nepstead did not attack immediately when he saw Avola stop. Long finish from Avola. Again, Nepstead had maybe the right distance, but his hand speed just wasn't there. He could have opened the distance a little more, maybe, and had a better shot at it, but still. Vola misses. Misses the second one as well. Goes off target. So this super fast, super close distance stuff is fine for Avola, but he hasn't actually managed to convert it into a touch, really. Um, which, good on Mepstead for staying alive. And again here, he goes off target. So I think Mepstead might actually just be safe going for those. I mean, he hasn't been able to hit, but it's it's certainly running the clock down. He can keep Avola from getting to 25. Avola takes a few jogging steps back. Again, these probing lunges Mepstead can get away from. Finds a counter post off target. That was nice. Now that situation favors, ugh, favors Mepstead more. Quite impressive. I mean, we saw how good Avola's parry post battle was uh, against his previous opponent. Flesh from Mepstead, though. Or more of a running attack that time, honestly. He's passed before he gets the light, though, on his Ramiz or counter post or whatever that was. So no touch, but very nice. Like I said, that close distance its starting to shift over to Mepstead's favor. The problem is he only has 30 seconds to really force that advantage. Wow. Not quite sure what Avola was thinking there, but Mepstead capitalizes easily, just taps him on the front shoulder to let him know to stay awake. More marching from Avola. 19 seconds left. So this period has honestly favored the Brits a little bit. But we'll see if there can be a last minute touch here. One more from Epstead would put them at half the score, but no. Still slightly below 50% of the points of the Italians. But not a bad showing there from Mepstead, considering Avola's previous bout where he just destroyed pegs. And here Mepstead offering some more advice to Ben Pegs, who will be fencing Alessio Facconi. So this will be the sixth period, or the sixth encounter, I should say. There's proper terminology for this that I've been kind of throwing around loosely. You guys know what I mean. Alright, so... Certainly feel like Pegs has been the weakest performing member of the British team so far. Also kind of surprised we haven't seen James Davis offense yet. Alright, Pegs marching. The thing we saw before, that just... Fast acceleration where he takes several steps at the same speed, that's going to probably again get destroyed by Ficoni, Uh if he does that. But that previous long finish looked better. Yeah, he's varying the tempo now. That's that's really nice. And there, it converts it straight into a pair or post. So Pegs has fixed that problem and gotten a point from it against a very strong opponent, so not too shabby. 
Yeah, that tempo change is working really well. Faconi doesn't know the right distance to counterattack, so he's probably not going to go for it. Misses the counter post though, and he finds the one in close. That is nice. <clears throat> These Brits with their infighting, man. It's paying off. I normally say the Italians have quite good point control at that distance, but they're managing to pull it back. Oh, this motion blur is making me a little bit, a little bit nauseous. Uh, final pair and post there from the left, and Ben Peggs is more than making up for his previous... Oh, there not so much. Steps forward, not really ready to finish, and Faconi just hits him with a lunge. But uh, do note that Faconi has to get to 30, so Be uh, Peggs has more time to work with. At least more points to work with. He can afford to bleed a few more touches. Faconi escapes that acceleration. And Peggs is absolutely fearless. More marching from Faconi. Uh, the splur isn't ideal. I can't really see where the blades are. Faconi parries. Steps in. Pegs with counterattack. Gets the remise off target as the core core happens. More just marching back and forth. These accelerations from Pegs are nice because, as I said before, he's not... Okay, that's getting a little dangerous. Although Faconi still wants to go for the counterattack, and... Huh. Surprised Pegs made that finish work, even, because that one was pretty consistent tempo as well. It wasn't as fast as the previous one, so maybe Faconi couldn't just auto counterattack and get lucky because he was rushing. But I thought he would make something happen a little bit sooner there, so that's, again, really nice for Pegs. Or possibly Faconi choking a little bit? I don't know. That acceleration, though! That was something right out of uh, Faconi's playbook, just super smooth. Slow step, slightly faster step, slightly faster step, and boom. And Faconi doesn't really know what hit him. Well, he does. It was a smooth finishing attack. But um, Faconi didn't see it coming until it was already too late. Great disguise on the finish there from Pegs. Oh, that time was not so good, though. Accelerates too fast. He reaches kind of his max speed too soon, and as a result... His feet are ahead of his hand, and he can't really finish. Um, kind of unfortunate there for Faconi that he didn't uh, get the counterattack, but, you know. What's the call here going to be? I have no idea. For me, this is simultaneous. Uh, of course, with the uh, help from the video referee, I'm sure there will probably be a call from this. Let's see. Attack no, attack touch. Makes sense. I can, I, if my memory is correct, I can see that. Uh, Pegs, though, has made quite a lot happen this bout. He can continue to do so. Faconi still has... Uh, oh, okay. Now he has five touches to go. In one minute, ten seconds. We're marching from Faconi. Pegs defending pretty well. Misses the Primer post. Goes off target instead. Still very nice that he's able to defend it all against Faconi. If there's one thing that I'm very impressed with these uh, British fencers, it's that they're surviving for very long periods against these Italians. It gives them a lot more chances to find touches that work. Gets a counterattack again. <laughs> Maybe a yellow card. Actually, that should almost certainly be a yellow card. Faconi wants to change his weapon. Maybe ref called halt before the twist was fully realized, but still, that was pretty egregious from Pegs. Hmm. Okay. That's preparation from the left. Yep. There was a tiny little timing window in there, but Faconi hit it. Whether by luck or by skill. Honestly, probably by skill. He is Italian after all, but still. Looks like Pegs might be letting this uh, encounter... He did... Yeah, again, he waits a tempo. Might have been a blade take there and wait, but Faconi is going straight, so we'll see. But at any rate, this isn't the movement that Pegs had before. The thing that really made him, that made his actions that did work works very well is that he was keeping very solid distance. Parapost, no. 
So the referee interprets that as his first post missing. I'm not, hmm. Retroactively, I'm not sure I see that. It looked more like a line change for Pegasus Repost. Huh. I'll need to keep an eye on that in the future. Attack right, yep. Pegs is letting the bow get away from him. No, this it was so promising earlier. He had it, but he was starting to let it get away from him. Again, that counter mm, counterattack was a little bit out of distance. The Coney officer counter time behind the head because I guess he realizes that Pegs isn't gonna turn it around. He's just gonna try and run past. We're marching for Pegs that time finds it. Fukoni goes for the auto counterattack when he sees Pegs going fast, but at that point it's too late. So that's nice. Slower, back and forth now. And again, that acceleration. I'm ooh, I'm surprised that one worked for Pegs. That one was a little bit rushed. Felt felt a little bit uh haphazard to me. Fukoni goes for the twist. It's probably the right decision. Oh, that's a nice long attack though. Pegs was not ready for that one. And that line change is too late this time if Fikoni's stepping in counterattack does work. Okay. And there's the bout. Or the uh, encounter. <laughs> you know what I mean. So, that started out really nice for Pegs. He made quite a few good touches happen. And we're now slightly behind uh, for the British. We're slightly, uh, slightly above half the score of the Italians, but still a commanding lead for them. We're going to go back to Keith Cook versus Giorgio Avola. Avola had a pretty strong performance against... Uh, oh, wait, no, was it him? I... Ah, uh, no. No! I'm starting to get the fencers confused. This is... Ah, uh, for a team match, this is terrible. I can't remember who fenced whom. Okay, we're just going to play it by ear. All right. Oh, I wish they would stop moving the camera back and forth like that. It's quite dizzying. All right. So, Cook, Avola. Cook has the footwork, he has the flicks. Avola has just super well-roundedness, lightning quick parry post, and pretty good tactics. So, Cook finishes though, and that's straight. Although Avola, being so far up, he has plenty of score to work with to figure Cook out. But still, that counterattack looked a little bit lazy. Cook marches. Again, constant line changes make it a little bit harder for Avola to find the right line to close out when he counterattacks. Interesting footwork decision there. Cook decides to stay in the distance and uh, pair a post. This time stays in the distance and counterattacks. Kind of a little one-two move there. <laughs> stay in the distance, show a big search, and then the next time you stay in the distance and just hit him as he's trying to worry about your huge search that does not exist. Cook tries to find a way in. Avola marches. Please show that... <sighs> okay, I'll go with what the referee said there, but I wish they would have turned the camera. This is a little bit annoying. Of course, it would probably be just as painful to be the cameraman in this uh, long team batch format. Yep, constant beats make it the pair of posts at the end there for Avola. So, I talk about this uh, quite a bit. Uh, beating the blade constantly means it's easier for your opponent to pair or post because they know where the blade is. It's beating their blade. So all they need to do is show a very strong one and the referee will usually give it to them. Remise from the left. I said this before, I was quite surprised that the British are doing so well in the close distance situation. You would think that the Italians' sheer point control would be enough to carry them through, but the Brits are finding some pretty creative touches in close. Very impressive. Uh, Cook's maybe a little bit more, uh, maybe that style's a little bit more endemic to him than with some of the other, uh, British fencers that I can remember, uh, remember how they fenced before. But at any rate, uh, what is Avola going to do against that? Uh, against previous two, he was completely unafraid of that close distance situation. And if that persists, he might actually walk into a couple of Cook's traps. Uh, simply because he's a little overconfident in that situation. Perhaps the Italians are a little bit used to being better in close. But that's not necessarily true here. Finishes long, no light though, and Cook gets a counterattack, or an attack. Huh. 
Italians are honestly maybe getting a little bit sloppy now. I don't know. Ooh. Like a dance, they both go for the behind the head touch at the same time, but it's one night for Evola. Although I think he actually found the blade last there too, so it would have been Cooks Remise anyway. If I'm not mistaken. Getting constant beats there for Cook. A lot of line changes as well. Ooh, this time though. Okay, that's another thing. Constant uh, beats do two things. Uh, in that if your opponent tries to parry at the exact same moment as the beat, it goes to the beat attack. Uh, so, interesting call here. If there was truly only one sound, then that is the correct call. Cook gets the beat attack. If there were two, as Avola I think was suggesting that there were, it would be his parry repost, assuming his parry came after the beat. Which is usually how uh, that phrase develops, if that's the case. Oh, okay. So this time it was reversed. There were two sounds, but the first was Avola's, the second was Cook's. And uh, it's then his beat attack, I suppose. Or possibly you could call that a counter post. Someone's weapon snapped. More marching for Vola. That, I would probably call that the Remise. Looked like his light was very delayed compared to when he actually hit the target. But, you know. That is something that Vola does quite a lot, actually. He'll basically score a few seconds before he actually turns the light on. That was a distance mistake there from Cook to try and step in like that. Avola was already on the blade. And he didn't need to score the touch immediately. Oof. Yowza. <laughs> um, yeah, that's something Avola does a lot. He waits for the mistake. And instead of just hitting immediately, he takes an insurance step forward. Uh, I guess confident that he can score from any uh, anything that his opponent does. If his opponent steps back, he just follows them out, usually with a flesh or a running attack like that. Uh, if his opponent steps in, he usually goes behind the back or behind the head. Um, but once he's forced a mistake like that from his opponent, there's really nothing they can do. Um, so Avola has this interesting idea of just, well, I score immediately. If you know you're going to keep the point, then I'll wait for your opponent's reaction to be, I guess, even more sure. Um, although, as we saw a lot, uh, or at least in the touch immediately following that, Avola's not above just, oh, hit you. <laughs> See the mistake, just hit it. Um, okay, Italians now with a 35-23 lead. That wasn't the cleanest of bats from Avola, but uh, against Keith Cook, maybe it's a little bit hard to be as clean as you want. Is that Gimek? Looks a little bit like him, but I don't think so. Looks like Ben Peggs is switching his jacket. Possibly because he's swept through it, and it's going to be conductive. That is a problem that occurs occasionally in foil, actually. Uh, if you sweat a lot... Uh, as I sometimes do, or as I very often do, I should say. Um, yeah, if the sweat conducts through the jacket and to your lame, there's a chance that if someone hits you off target, it can conduct, it can actually conduct through the sweat to your lame and cause the red or green light to go off. In that situation, the touch still stands if the right of way works out the same way, um, because the fencer is responsible for maintaining their own equipment. So, especially at this level where people are working obviously very hard. Uh, sweating profusely. It's not uncommon to see uh, fencers with several jackets to switch off every now and then just to make sure that doesn't happen. At least that's what I think was going on there. It's possible that he just didn't like how it fit um, or maybe it had a little hole in it. I don't know. But uh, usually the main thing for that is the sweat. That actually happened once at the London Olympics, if I'm not mistaken. I want to say that it was like a Japan versus Italy team match that that happened, if, I, if my memory serves. Um... But yeah, okay, yeah, tested on the arm. Still one off target, so that's a good sign. Test on targets, and it looks good. So yeah, that was almost certainly why he switched jackets there. So, Ben Peggs had a quite disappointing uh, first encounter, and a very good-looking second one up until it wasn't. So we'll see which of the two is going to happen against Kassara. Losing the first touch immediately in close. Brits have had some nice close-distance touches this bout, but we'll... S that's Simon, yeah. Um, but Kasara is deceptively, he's tall, so you think maybe close distance actions are a little bit more, uh, effective against him. Not actually that true. He's just as good at putting the tip on, uh, in close as anyone. And here he just finishes straight as Pegs tries to counterattack. So this does not look good for Pegs. 
Um, his, re his really his ace in the hole that he had against uh, Faconi does not seem to be working very well. At least I could tell you that if I could see what the fencers should. Oh, yeah, patient march from Kassar is all he needs, and just wait for the wait for the distance to collapse, and then put the tip on. Nice and easy for Kassar. Oh, got to stay alive with the paired post skin there. But again, Pegs may be a bit over eager to get in the distance. Kassar just takes a big step back, lets him fall over, and then again, parry post to seal it. He does make it look quite easy. That should be Simul, if I'm not mistaken. You could maybe argue that because Pegs is stepping back at the very end there, it might be his counterattack, but I doubt it. Let's see. Simultaneous, yep. A little confusion there from both fencers, I guess. More marching from Kasara. Only needs one more point. Can Pegs do anything about this? Ooh. So that's like, that's the danger there. Kasara had the right idea stepping in with Prem. He just missed it, but still. You wouldn't expect that uh, immediate reaction from him being so tall. You might expect him to maybe take a moment to try and step back first. But he's unafraid of that situation. And there he gets the parry post again. Pretty much all of his touches there were pegs falling over trying to hit him, and him just opening the distance, the distance slightly. Uh, and I think he was still arguing about that previous uh, touch that was called simul. I don't know. But yeah. Kasara knew the mistake he wanted to force out of pegs, and pegs kind of just did that mistake, and Kasara capitalized. Pretty straightforward in that respect. The actions that he used to do it were quite varied. And that is another thing with the Italians, their, their toolkit is very wide, in addition to being very deep. Um, they can often apply the same tactics with wildly different actions, if that makes sense. Uh, maybe the counter time without using the blade and just using distance uh, previously is an example. So, quite, quite foxy. Foxy like a Lice Volpi, if anyone gets the joke. Um... The, the joke is that her, her last name means foxes. Um, I shouldn't have explained that because now it's no longer funny. But time has been successfully wasted and we're going to start... No, we're not going to start the encounter. Do I have any more bad jokes? No? Okay. Mepstead versus Faconi. Final period. Mepstead, of course, against the ropes. He has been doing pretty well. I'd say he's been the most consistent performer of the British this match. Gets his stop hit running away. Despite Faconi's pretty fast acceleration there, Faconi actually kind of fell into the problem that um, Pegs had earlier, where he kind of reached his consistent speed too soon, and he made a couple of steps in a row that gave uh, Mepstead the right timing. And that's Alessio stepping past. Yeah, Alessio was the one to step past, and therefore his touch delivered as he's passed is annulled. As I said before, Mepstead's greatest strength has been staying alive, but the thing is, he's down 16 points. You can't really sit back and wait if you're at this situation and uh, the score, the time is rapidly ticking down. He's got to do... <laughs> he's got to win... Oh, there. Long finish. Where did he hit? Did he hit the arm? That might be Faconi's jacket conducting through. I couldn't actually tell precisely where he hit. Faconi might opt to change his jacket now. No matter what he does, the touch should stand. That should not be an ult. Yep, and there it is. So, um, Metstead basically has to win about 15-0 to 0 against Alessio Faconi, of all people, to equalize. So, clearly, uh, going to be an uphill battle for him. Faconi has to get five touches to win, of course. Um, but we shall see. I, I'm not going to lie. It's very, very unlikely that the British will win. But we'll see what Metstead can do with this. Um, he has very limited time to, in theory, score quite a few touches if he wants to actually have a shot at equalizing. If he plays passively, he'll probably end up doing better touch for touch, um, as he was quite able to escape the uh, other Italians' attacks. But that will not be a very fast way of scoring, and if he opts for that strategy, it'll probably result in a British loss. If he just goes complete, like, balls to the wall go for it, constant attacking, Faconi will probably shut him down even faster. But at that point, like, you couldn't blame him because he needs to get touches fast. Uh, in the meantime, we have 
Who is this in the background? That's France on the right. Is that... Can't tell who that is. tony has got his new jacket. Actually, no, he, he wasn't wearing a jacket at the time. He's still got to put it on. Who is that on the left side in the other strip? I can't tell who that is. Maybe a more obscure team. There were some um, pretty unfamiliar teams in the round of eight at this competition that I can remember. And France is probably uh, high enough ranked that they would be up against uh, maybe a weaker team to start out. You can see in the background is Enzo Lafour without a shirt. <laughs> I'm not sure why I immediately locked onto him. Um, and in the foreground, Alessio Ficconi is putting his LeMay back on, so we should be back fairly soon. There's also a shot of, I believe, Chipressa there, standing in the front of the white t-shirt. Alright, Ficconi puts his glove back on. We're nearly there, come on. Just one more period. Oh, my voice has to survive. You gotta dig deep for this one. <clears throat> Alright. 15 touches between Mepstead and Equalizing in 2 minutes 32. Um, I can think of like maybe one instance where someone has actually done that, uh, and it was not at this level. Test the arm, it goes off target, that's a good sign. Again, yep, looks good. And bout is going to resume. Alright. <clears throat> Mepstead not being super, super aggressive, at least not yet. But yeah, he is he is doing his normal thing. So it looks like he's not necessarily going for the win as uh, opposed to just going for touches which is commendable uh, cons uh, pretty common maximum fencing is one touch at a time uh, of course this is going to be one touch for a t uh, excuse me one touch at a time for Ficconi as well and there's the first one Mepstead does do a good job staying alive but honestly this is probably fine for Ficconi he doesn't need to fence super hard Mepstead maybe finds the final repose there yep another touch for him but honestly, Ficconi isn't too worried about hitting at this point, or at least he shouldn't be. All he needs to do is stay alive for two minutes himself. You, of course, don't want to just step back and be completely passive, because Mepstead then will have free reign to attack. But for Ficconi, there's not much reason to push the issue too far, or make any mistakes like getting too close. And you can afford to put the burden on Mepstead here in this position, definitely. More marching from Mepstead. He's not committing to any attacks, though, and the time's just going to get away from him, and... Long finish there for Verconi. Mepstead isn't quite getting away fast enough. So, uh... With that, I'm... It, is it too premature at this moment to say it's all over by the shouting? Perhaps. There is still a minute 30. But this about ends with maybe more of a whimper than a roar. Which, to be fair, the Italians had a pretty commanding lead the entire way through. Although, I have to say... Not a bad performance at all from the uh, British team, the younger British team, uh, who are starting, I guess, more recently to be the core of the British international squad. So, despite this uh, sure to be lost for them, uh, it's still very impressive. And the touches they did get were a lot of like close distance stuff, which normally the Italians are pretty good at. And in addition to that, they were all staying alive for a very long time. And I have a feeling that if these were to go to 15 touch bouts between them, um, it would have been pretty close. So certainly disappointing there for the Brits, but not completely double negative incoming. Not completely not promising, uh, if that makes sense. And of course, the Italians showing why they're such a dominant force in men's foil these days. Also, kind of surprised James Andrew Davis didn't compete. He might be injured or something. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, uh, hope you appreciated finally doing a team match. And I'm just realizing now I'm going to have to find a way to implement that on the website because I don't currently have support for actually multiple fencers on each side. 
in about, so I'm going to probably have to code that really fast before I put this on uh, on the website. But anyway, thank you for watching and for bearing with me for 50 whole minutes of nonstop fencing action. Thanks for watching, guys, and as always, stay sharp.